The Eagle and Child, Episode 36. Mere Christianity, Book 4, Chapter 7. Let's Pretend. Hello, and welcome to The Eagle and Child, the hallowed pub of the Inklings. This is a podcast where each week, my friend Matt and I share a beer, and we discuss the writings of the author known to the world as Clive Staples Lewis, or C.S. Lewis, or just as Jack to his friends. My name is David, and as usual, I will be pretending to be a competent podcaster, together with my co-host Matt. I have this sense of deja vu right now, do you? (laughs) Uh, Didn't you already ask me that? Yeah, this sounds eerily familiar. Yes, listeners, we have recorded this episode before, but GarageBand decided to eat the audio. So here we are again. I'm feeling like we're about to bring our A game. It, when, when David texted me and said that the GarageBand lost the recording, I actually was somewhat relieved because I felt that was one of the lower quality ones I've recorded in a long time. And so this just gives me a chance to redeem myself. All right. So in that case, redeem yourself with giving us a quote of the week. This comes from the collected letters of C.S. Lewis. And he says, Remember, he is the artist, and you are only the picture. You can't see it, so quietly submit to be painted, i.e. keep fulfilling all the obvious duties of your station, and you really know quite well enough what they are, asking forgiveness for each failure, and then leaving it alone. You are in the right way. Walk. Don't keep on looking at it. Beautiful. And that'll make sense later. (laughs) So that was our quote of the week, the drink of the week. Matt and I, we're keeping it pretty simple until we have a chance to really sync up on our drinks. Because as you know, Matt is now in New York and I'm still in San Diego. So this week, we're just going to be drinking some Dos Equis. If we have any listeners that are in New York too, please email david or contact him some way and let me know because i would love to meet up with someone and with that cheers cheers so this last week we passed the ten thousand download mark so that means that since you and i began this podcast ten thousand episodes have now been downloaded that's it yeah (laughs) i think that's pretty mind-blowing i thought we would have been further along by now come on guys we need some likes some shares some reviews Pick up some slack here, listeners. Says the man who's not even on social media. (laughs) Says the man who's done, like, nothing uh, with the promoting. Although somehow I would would say my network has really shared this quite a bit, I think. Well, actually, on the last episode, we had the greatest number of downloads on the first day. We had about 450. Oh, wow. Well, that's fantastic. That means a bunch of people have, have it automatically download, whether they listen to it or not, probably. Or they keep coming back, hoping that we will get better. One of these days. One of these days. There's four more episodes to redeem ourselves. There's a few more before we finish Mere Christianity. But seriously, thank you everyone for taking some of your time out of your life, half an hour each week, to listen to our podcast. Uh, It means a lot, and uh, we we promise we'll try and get better. We do. David and I love doing this. Uh, it's, It's a passion project for us. And to know that there are other individuals out there who want to give up some of their precious time, the most valuable resource to listen to us, just talk is fantastic. Now, obviously, David and I know you're coming for C.S. Lewis, not us, but it's still an honor to be able to be an instrument of Lewis's works to you guys. Ooh, I see what you did there. That was clever. Yeah, you know, I try. Again, all this will become clearer as we look at today's chapter. Every once in a while, I can live up to your level of cleverness, David. (laughs) Speaking of my cleverness or lack thereof, there's one thing I've been meaning to mention for a while now. Do you remember when we told that story about C.S. Lewis and the beggar? Oh, yeah. Well, we had been saying that Lewis's companion that day was probably Tolkien. Well, I actually have a correction. It wasn't. About a month ago, I watched Eric Metaxas interview Walter Hooper. And Hooper was Lewis's secretary towards the end of his life. And in that interview, Hooper says that he was the other person in that story. I don't know why people say all the time that you can't admit you're wrong. (laughs) I think you're quite good at it. Well, yeah, I think they just say it because I'm not very often wrong. So I rarely get the opportunity for people to see me admit that I'm wrong. Oh, sure. Keep telling yourself that. I I do. I do. (laughs) Did you have to make that comment to clean that taste out of your mouth? (laughs) 
Exactly. Uh, but I will put a link to those Walter Hooper videos in the show notes. Because if you want to get a sense of what C.S. Lewis was like, listening to Walter Hooper speak about his former boss and friend, there's, there's nothing better. There's a very cool story that Walter Hooper wrote in a foreword. And since we get to re-record this episode, I get to correct myself because you corrected me on the last one. It's <laughs> you don't, not you don't a... need to tell people that. I could have just let that go. I really could have. <laughs> I enjoy this though. It's a, I don't know if we've ever, we've only once before I think re-recorded. So it's a weird dynamic. But it, it, Walter Hooper wrote about, I think, who was it? Someone who was at Lewis's house? It was, the, it was towards the end of his life and they had a live-in nurse. That's what it was, live-in nurse. And the live-in nurse was sleeping. And I guess they were cleaning out, you thought, potentially Lewis's office or study or some sort of uh, teaching room. And he had all these books coming back to his house. And so they surrounded the nurse while they were sleeping in maybe, I think it was something like 2,000 books. And when the nurse woke up, all disgruntled and disoriented of where, where they're at, they tripped over all of these books and Lewis just dies laughing. <laughs> he was a jokester. He was a kid at heart. Yeah, he wasn't the same austere man that you see portrayed in the movie Shadowlands. He was much no. more fun than that. But yes, Walter Hooper, he's got lots of great stories like that. Actually, just before we get started, I'd also recommend to you, Eric Metaxas, the guy that does these interviews with Walter Hooper. He wrote a phenomenal book on Bonhoeffer. And I know you quote him all the time. I love Bonhoeffer. I, for this program I'm a part of, the next book that we have to read by the end of October is Life in Community. That's the next book of his that I actually want to read. Yeah, let's read it together. Okay. All right, deal. <laughs> all right, let's, uh, let's get on with today's chapter. So the chapter kicks off by Jack reminding us of two stories where pretense ultimately leads to reality. The first story he reminds us of is Beauty and the Beast, where a lady kisses this animal as though he's a handsome man, and magically he becomes one. Now, my female friends have assured me that this doesn't actually work in reality. <laughs> a couple of things about this. One, one of my favorite scenes in the Beauty and the Beast is, can you guess it? The library scene. Yes. <laughs> so I, I've always wanted a library, a study in my future house. They used to always tell people, my future wife can design everything, do whatever she wants to the house, but I'm building a library. Like, that's very important to me. Well, I'd say you also want a woman who reacts to a library in the same way that Belle does. Ah, well, that would be ideal. Well, the second story he tells us, and I'm not sure if we're meant to know, was this a well-known story at the time? I'm not sure. But he tells the story of a man who wore a beautiful mask for a year. And over the course of that year, his face came conformed to that attractive shape of the mask. And again, this doesn't happen in real life. Yes, I don't think it's been medically verified. So don't try it at home. If we could create that, oh man, we would be very wealthy individuals. You mean by taking casts of our own face for other people to use? <laughs> Funny part is actually, as I'm saying that out loud, that's pretty much essentially what plastic <laughs> surgery does. This is true. Anyway, Lewis then seems to apparently switch gears. And he reminds us that for the last few chapters, we've spoken about becoming a son of God. And he now addresses the practical consequences of this because all theology should be practical. Just otherwise, what's the point? He turns to the Our Father, and in particular, those opening two words, Our Father. He says this, Do you now see what those words mean? They mean, quite frankly, that you are putting yourself in the place of a son of God. To put it bluntly, you are dressing up as Christ, if you like, pretending. And when you do this, when you dress up as Christ, when you pretend to be a son of God, what's interesting is you first realize what a poor imitation you make, because we're not sons of God. <laughs> we fall far short, some of us more than others. Stop looking at me. <laughs> and and when, what Lewis says is the moment you realize what the words mean, you realize that you are not a son of God. You are not being like the son of God, whose will and interests are at one with those of the Father. We're just a bundle of self-centered fears, hopes, greeds, jealousies, and self-conceit, all doomed to death. That's quite a depressing, albeit accurate, analysis of humanity. I'd say that sums me up pretty well. Jack points out that calling God our Father is outrageous cheek. 
which in American means very cheeky, but also comments that this is what God commands us to do. And God has done so because there are two kinds of pretending. He says that there's a good kind of pretending and a bad kind. Exactly. The bad kind of pretending where you promise to help someone you don't versus the good kind of pretending where the pretense ultimately leads to the real thing. And he gives two examples here to prove his point. The first one he gives is that of children's games, saying that when children pretend they're hardening their muscles and sharpening their wits so that the pretense of being grown up helps them to grow up in earnest, pretending to be parents or shopkeepers. How about cowboys? That's a good one. I mean, what, it's, what, what did you pretend to be growing up? I, I had a very boring childhood. <laughs> I'm actually genuinely curious, though, is that do people in England pretend to be shopkeepers and parents more? I mean, the United States, it's genuinely police officers, cowboys. Uh, we do all that as well. I don't know. Those were just the first two things that came to mind when I thought of kindergarten. And there were always some of the girls that wanted to play house. Some of the toys that we had at kindergarten were a play shop where people pretend to go in and buy stuff. So that's the difference. You were a stud at a young age and you were hanging out with the women very early in life. Yeah, let, let's say that. That makes me sound less sad. <laughs> but we, but I'm we, trying to help you out here, thank David. Thank you, thank you. But no, we also, we also did the other thing. You know, we pretended that we were superheroes and soldiers and all that sort of stuff. You know how cool would be my favorite superhero is Batman. I'm Batman. I don't think he sounds like that. <laughs> but, but Lewis's point, I never really thought of it in this way. The idea that children's play is preparing them for their life ahead. Which gives me great hope, because, you know, I pretended to be Superman, so someday I might get those powers. You are almost there, David. Don't lose hope. I already wear my underwear on the outside of my pants. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> the other and this is why I moved away from San Diego, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, the second example that Lewis gives is pretending to be friendly when you're not feeling friendly. He says the best thing you can do is put on a friendly manner and behave as if you were a nice, hospitable person. And he says you'll soon discover that you actually become friendlier in that process. As an introvert, this, this, this literally describes my life. <laughs> Me too. Me too. But it's also true. One thing I've heard people say is if you're not feeling friendly, pretend that you are the host of the party and assume that role, and you'll naturally become more outgoing. Here's another thought I had when we were preparing this for the second time. Uh, when I dress up in a suit, you know, I stand a little bit straighter. I speak a little bit clearer. I am much more likely to open doors for other people and be more polite. There's something about putting on a suit that does that to me. Anyway, the point that Lewis is trying to make in all of this is that very often the only way to get equality is to really start trying to behave as though you had it already. It's the fake it till you make it. Precisely. And psychology has shown that works. So returning to the Our Father, Lewis says that when we pray this prayer and realize the meaning of those opening words, Our Father, that we are dressing up as Christ. We will very likely immediately notice some way in which pretense could be made less of a pretense and more of a reality. Yeah, he says that as you realize this, you might realize that there are things in your life that you should be doing and are not, or things that you shouldn't be doing and are. And he says, well, we'll go and act on it. And as this is happening, as we're pretending, what's happening deep down is Jesus is turning that pretense into reality. Lewis has used this language before. He's injecting that zoe, that divine life into us. And so we're beginning to see the tin soldier turning into a live man. And that part of you that doesn't like it is that tin part. It's the part rejecting, trying to, trying to stop this from happening because it's scary. I mean, it's a transformation of letting go of yourself. As I was reading this part, I was asking myself, what's the tin part in me? When Jesus is slowly doing the work of transforming my natural life into the divine life, what are the parts of me that are resisting that process? What's that part that I'm holding on to, that part that I don't want him to kill? And he makes a point that this isn't just a fancy way of talking about your conscience. He says, if you simply ask your conscience, you get one result. If you remember that you are dressing up as Christ, you get a different one. There are lots of things which your conscience might not call definitively wrong especially things in your mind. 
but which you will see at once you cannot go on doing if you are seriously trying to be like Christ. For you are no longer thinking simply about right and wrong. You're trying to catch the good infection from a person. It is more like painting a portrait than like obeying a set of rules. And the odd thing is that while in one way it is much harder than keeping rules, in another way it is far easier. How I would describe it is you could pretend to act like a good person every single day and your actions are lining up. But inside of you, there's we all have that running monologue that judges people and has this negativity and these things going on in our head that aren't necessarily the kindest things if, if the world knew what we were thinking. That makes me think of this here, that when, we, when Christ forms in us, we're going to start realizing it's not all about right or wrong. It's about becoming a person that sees the world differently, sees it from a place of love, compassion, gentleness, mercy. That's what I think of. And Lewis mentions here about it being harder and easier. And we're actually going to come back to this question in a later episode when we ask, is Christianity hard or easy? It'd be fun if people would email us and answer the question of, do you think Christianity is hard or easy and why? Now, Lewis says that the idea of being acted on by Christ may seem to many people to be an alien concept. You may say, he says, I have never had the sense of being helped by an invisible Christ, but I have often been helped by other human beings. Lewis rather cheekily says that this is rather like the woman in the First World War who said that a bread shortage wouldn't bother her house because they only ate toast. He says, if there was no bread, there will be no toast. And so in the same way, if there's no help from Christ, there'll be no help from other human beings. God works through nature, through our bodies, through books, and sometimes through experiences which seem at the time even anti-Christian. Yeah, when I'm looking at my life, there's so many moments that it's either a book or a person, some encounter, some book that I read, some individual, even some movie that pulls me back to the path, that reminds me that I've strayed off, that my thinking is deviated from God. And he even comments that the Spirit of Christ might be nearer to someone than it ever was before, when that person realizes that they've just been going through the motions of being a Christian and now realize that they don't believe it and stop going to church. I mean, why do you think he says that? I would imagine it's because at that point they're actually taking it seriously. They're, they're for the first time actually asking the question of, is this true or not? And only then will they, they truly come to the truth or, or not. Obviously, that's a, a possibility. And I think it was, was it Lewis maybe that said sometimes the atheist is closer to Christianity than we realize because they're actually, and, and by atheist, I should preface that, an atheist that's strong in their views because they've been researching and digging into it because at least they're searching for truth. At least they're actually trying. And if they're presented the right thing, there's a chance they will turn to it. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. But coming back to that earlier idea, Jack explains that he thinks God's favorite method for reaching people is through other people. And he says that it's for this reason that the church, the whole body of Christians, is so important. Talk about responsibility as a Christian, that we have to bear Christ in everything we do. I think of the times I'm in a car and I get super angry. And thankfully, that person doesn't know I'm a Christian, and so I might be able to get away with it a little bit. But, <laughs> but still, that's not the point. Every single opportunity we have is an opportunity to uh, show Christ in a way. I also like that Lewis points out is these carriers, which can be us, can sometimes be doing it unconsciously. Yeah, he even says that there were people who weren't Christians themselves who helped him to Christianity. And that reminded me of a passage in his spiritual autobiography, Surprised by Joy. He said that one of the hardest boiled of all the atheists he ever knew sat in his room on the other side of the fire and remarked that the evidence for the historicity of the Gospels was really surprisingly good. Rum thing, he went on. All that stuff of phrases about the dying God, rum thing. It almost looks as if it really happened once. The funny thing is, I just texted you this morning, letting you know I'm starting this deeper dive into the historical accuracy of Jesus. I've read some surface stuff that has strongly suggested from people I trust, incredible sources of the historical validity of the crucifixion and resurrection. But I decided now's the time for me to really dig into this and take it to the next level. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Lewis says, it's important that we recognize Christ behind his instruments. 
Christ is the real giver of the gifts. We can't look at the person themselves as the end, because that's going to let us down. The best of people will make mistakes. All of them will die. We must be thankful to all the people who have helped us. We must honor them and love them. But Lewis emphasizes, never, never pin your whole faith on any human being, not if he is the best and wisest in the world. I think this is a really good balance piece of advice here, because when I think back to the people who really helped me in my Christian journey, God used them to communicate his love and his life to me. I particularly think of Sister Maeve, who was a missionary at my university. I always described her as shiny. And now looking back, what I see is it was something about the life of God that she projected into my life. And some of these people, they're not even living. They're people that I've met in books, sometimes old books, sometimes you know, centuries old. I think of St. Teresa. I think of St. Maximilian Kolbe, both very influential people that when, when I read about their lives and, and have learned about their stories and their journeys, it's, they, they embody Christ. Exactly. And when I think about these people, my mother, Sister Maeve, Mother Teresa, St. Francis of Assisi, I start to recognize that what I loved about them is Christ in them. That is the beauty that is drawing me to them. In this couldn't actually come at a more, I almost use the word perfect time, but very unfortunate time. But as we deal with the church scandal right now, Bishop Barron gave a, a talk on, on the scandal going on. And I remember he finished it. We don't go to a church or we don't get involved in a community because of the moral excellency of the pastor. And it makes me think of Matthew Kelly. He goes, find a perfect church and then join it. It's no longer going to be perfect. We, we enter these communities that are broken, imperfect, because we see Christ working in them. And we encounter Christ through it. But we know that the entire body is going to be imperfect and broken from time to time. Even look at the apostles. <laughs> they, they screwed up countless times. Out of the apostles that were chosen by Jesus, one betrayed him, one denied him three times, all but one of them fled at the cross. And still, this was the church that he founded. But in some ways, it's weirdly encouraging because it shows us that God can work even through sinful, fallen people. It's ultimately Christ that we look to as the source of life and light in Christianity. And great saints can reveal that to us. But we still have to remember that they're fallen human beings. Lewis ends that section with a, a rather chilling line. He says, there's lots of nice things that you can do with sand, but do not try building your house on it. <laughs> that wouldn't work so well. There's a verse in scripture that says the man who built the house on the rock, the storm came, swept, and the, 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 the house was good. And then the person who built it on the sand, the storm came, the waves rose, and the house was swept away. It's all about the right foundation. As the chapter draws to a close, Jack emphasizes that putting on Christ, this entire transformation into a son of God, is not the same thing as reading what Christ said and just trying to do the same. He says, it's a living man coming and interfering with your very self, killing the old natural self in you and replacing it with the kind of self he has. At first for only moments and then for longer periods. This is the idea of cumulative interest that we've spoken about before. Finally, he says, if all goes well, turning you permanently into a different sort of thing into a new little Christ, a being which, in its own small way, has the same kind of life as God, which shares in his power, his joy, his knowledge, and eternity. And as we proceed through this process, there's going to be two things we ultimately notice. The first is not just our sinful acts, but our entire sinful nature. And Lewis describes performing this daily examine. And it's an examination of conscience at the end of the day where we reflect on ultimately our conscience, what, what we did right, what we did wrong, our actions. And as you do this, you're going to notice quite how sinful we are at our core, <laughs> how often we screw up. And he says that when he thinks about the wrong things he's done, the excuses that immediately springs to my mind is that the provocation was so sudden and unexpected. I was caught off guard. I had no time to collect myself. Surely what a man does when he is taken off his guard is the best evidence for what sort of man he is. 
surely what pops out before the man has time to put on disguise is the truth. And he fleshes this out with an example of rats in a cellar. He says that if you go down into the cellar making lots of noise, when you finally turn on the light, you will see no rats. And that's not because there necessarily are no rats. It's just you've given them a warning that you're coming, so they had a chance to hide. Whereas in contrast, he says, if you sneak down very quietly and suddenly turn on the light, you'll see the rats that are there. And he says that it's not the suddenness that creates the rats. It just prevents them from hiding. It allows you to see them. And so applying this to the moral life, he says, in the same way, the suddenness of the provocation does not make me an ill-tempered man. It only shows me what an ill-tempered man I am. And the next bit, when I read it, just broke my heart. He said, apparently the rats of resentment and vindictiveness are always there in the cellar of my soul. Oof. Lewis then makes a profound observation. He says that we can have some control over our acts, but no direct control over our temperament. As a result, he says, after the first step in the Christian life, we realize that everything which really needs to be done in our souls can be done only by God. And this is how he ends the chapter. He says that he has been talking as if it were we who did everything. In reality, of course, it is God who has done everything. We, at most, allow it to be done to us. Everything is a grace. Even even the ability to say yes is a grace. We have to say yes. We have to allow God to work in us. But even that is a grace in its own right, because we we would have nothing to say yes to or no one to allow to work in us if God didn't give us that opportunity. And that ties us back to your opening quotation about being painted. Yeah, we just let the painter use the brush and build this incredibly beautiful image. It's always good for us to time to time point out the different major themes in Lewis. And one that he's mentioned before in Mere Christianity is, if you remember, I believe it was on the episode of Faith, and he talked about... When we give everything we have, we try to be the best person we can, it's only then that we'll realize that we fail miserably and we can have true faith that God is working in us. Because we can't do it on our own. I think the line in there, he says, when you reach the point when you say to God, I can't do this, you must. That's a great realization in the spiritual journey. And this is how he ends the chapter. He says that in a certain way, it's God who's doing the pretending in order to bring about the change in us. And he says that this is how the higher thing raises the lower. And he gives the example of a mother teaching her baby to talk. She does it by speaking to her child as if she is already being understood. And that really reminded me of the prodigal son. This son, he rejects his family, he takes all of his inheritance, squanders it. But as he's coming back, as soon as the father sees him on the horizon, the father rushes back to him, puts sandals on his feet, put a ring on his finger, a cloak around him, he is treating him like he is the best son. And I'm sure in time as he experienced this grace, he did become the son that the father was pretending he actually was. That's such a beautiful image. What a good way to end. Please feel free to email us, Instagram, Twitter, at Pints with Jack. And as usual, I've got an iTunes review of a podcast that I like to listen to just to inspire you to write lovely words about us on iTunes, here is today's. Comedy of the Week is a production of BBC Radio 4. Every Sunday night, they offer an episode from some British comedy programme. Whether it's the delightfully awful puns of Tim Vine, or the fast-paced episodes of Just a Minute, it offers a wide sample of the best of current British comedy. You know, a side benefit of these reviews, actually maybe the only benefit of these reviews, <laughs> I was going to say, the benefit you're thinking is just inspiring people to leave reviews, but yours are so thoughtful, people are probably intimidated to leave them now. You know, I get that a lot. People find my excellence intimidating. <laughs> oh, man, David, we need to get you some humility. Already got it. <laughs> Winning. Now I'm not going to say my next comment because <laughs> it's only going to boost your ego even more. But I was going to say that it's, we're getting this, this beautifully curated list. People might as well just skip everything we say, come to this end, and they're going to hear some pretty incredible podcasts because the ones you've been reviewing sound really interesting. I'm okay with that. And as we close the episode where we hit 10,000 downloads, we want to again thank everybody. And David, further up. And further in. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>